The views expressed on the following broadcast do not necessarily reflect those of KHLT, Take 12 Radio, or our affiliates. The opinions on this show should not be considered as medical, psychological, or professional advice and are those of the host, co-host, and guest. Take 12 Radio and KHLT Recovery Broadcasting are not affiliated with any particular 12-step fellowship. One day at a time with its failures and fears With portion of pain and burden of care We must be Welcome to Walking Through the Language of the Heart, a journey into the grapevine writings of Alcoholics Anonymous co-founder, Bill W. And now, here are your co-hosts, Chris S. and the Monty Man. Welcome, family, to another episode of Walking Through the Language of the Heart. Chris S. is on the phone with me, and my one of my buttons is not working. There we go. Ah, oh, technology. Welcome aboard, Chris. How are you this week? Good, Monty. Good. It's been a good week. I hope it's been a good week for you. It, it has been. A little bit of a shocker today, though, with the news from across the pond, huh? Yeah. 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 Wow. wow. You know, <laughs> you know uh, it, it was said that even though uh, Queen Elizabeth was definitely, you know, in her golden years i mean it's not that big of a surprise and yet it almost seems unreal because she's been with us ever since we can remember oh before i was born yeah she was queen yeah so, so yeah uh, did you did you see the crown that that uh that miniseries yes or that that was phenomenal that, wasn't it amazing that was amazing yeah yeah uh, I think they have some more episodes too. I don't know that I've caught up on those, but yeah, just just really informative. Uh, just a, a I don't know what I don't know what the monarchy thinks of that film uh, series, but I know I enjoyed it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, oh, I loved it. I loved it. I thought it was pretty good. All right. So the language of the heart for those who may never have tuned into this broadcast is uh, is a book, a very popular book, that features all of AA co-founder Bill W.'s writings in the grapevine all the way from 1944 to 1970. And Chris and myself are going through each one of the articles. <sighs> this is article number 10. And what's it entitled, Chris? Who is a member of Alcoholics Anonymous? Not Not to get involved in anything controversial, <laughs> so when I posted the preview of this um, that this was coming up I got a couple of private uh, messages and a couple emails that were kind of going you know their attitude was a little bit what are you guys doing <laughs> you know so not to worry we're going to take it right from the horse's mouth absolutely well we're still going to cause trouble oh yeah you bet we, <laughs> that's what we do Yeah, but alright well let's jump in so so, so again, we're on part one. There's three parts to this book, uh, Language of the Heart. Mm -hmm. This is August 1946, and Bill, Bill is uh, Bill is writing a little bit more about the the direction he gave for who can be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. That, that basically was in the text, Alcoholics Anonymous. Mm -hmm. You know, but he's going to give us more information on it. So I'm real interested to hear what he has to say in 1946. Now, to put this in context. This is this is when this is when all the servicemen came back from World War II. When mm. you, you know, 1945, 1946, all the, that's how long ago this was. Wow. Wow. <laughs> so yeah. you know, black and white movie day. You right. know? So 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 anyway, who is a member of Alcoholics Anonymous? The first edition of the book Alcoholics Anonymous makes this brief statement about membership. The only requirement for membership is an honest desire to stop drinking. 
We are not aligned with any particular faith, sect, or denomination, nor do we oppose anyone. We simply wish to be helpful to those who are afflicted. This expressed our feeling as of 1939, the year our book was published. So I guess he's leading us on to think that, you know, he's expanded his, uh, mm-hmm. his perspective on this. He says, since that day, all kinds of experiments with membership have been tried. The number of membership rules which have been made and mostly broken are legion. Uh-huh. Two or three years ago, the central office asked the groups to list their membership rules and send them in. This was really a, a famous thing that they did. Wow. After they arrived, we set them all down. They took a great many sheets of paper. A little reflection upon these many rules brought us to an astonishing conclusion. If all of these edicts had been in force everywhere at once, it would have been practically impossible for any alcoholic to have ever joined Alcoholics Anonymous. About nine-tenths of our oldest and best members could never have got by. So, so <laughs> you know, this, the ultimate freedom that, uh, that, he, that, that was allowed in the early AA, you know, you just put, your, put, your, put a meeting together, you know, and you ran it. Right. Uh, he, he understood that there had to be a little bit more you know, there there had to be more guardrails uh, to to keep us safe from ourselves, mm-hmm. and 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 it's really cool that there was someone paying that much attention in the early days of Alcoholics Anonymous to take such pains to document the challenges and document the best practices that came out of mm. early Alcoholics Anonymous. You know? Yeah, yeah, indeed. In some cases, we would have been too discouraged by the demands made upon us. Most of the early members of AA would have been thrown out because they slipped too much, because their morals were too bad, because they had mental as well as alcoholic difficulties, or, believe it or not, because they did not come from the so-called better classes of society. (laughs) We oldsters could have been excluded for our failure to read the book Alcoholics Anonymous or the refusal of our sponsor to vouch for us as a candidate, and so would an infinitum. The way our worthy alcoholics have sometimes tried to judge the less worthy is, as we look back on it, rather comical. Imagine, if you can, one alcoholic judging another. And I, you know, Monty, I'm, I'm going to talk about something here for a minute. This, it's really been, you know, a, co- a constant thing that I've been, I've been really thinking about, really meditating on a lot. Uh, this past year. And that's that's the stigma of alcoholism. And I'm not talking about the stigma that the world has toward alcoholics or doctors or police or judges or whatever. Not to, I'm talking about the internal stigma that sometimes happens. Mm. And again, I'm not immune to it you know, you know like like a newcomer will come in and they'll be really disruptive or whether whatever and it's really it, it's really easy to dislike that person yeah or you know, someone has relapsed for the 45th time you know and is coming back and wants to ride home i mean you know those are just a couple of examples and it's 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 easy for me it's easy for me to become a become annoyed and inconvenienced you know, mm. by 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 these these other alcoholics, and I see that as stigma. I see that as 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 prejudiced and and as you know, really uh, uh, an un, an un, unthinking judgmentalism. You know, they're up against alcoholism, just like I am. I'm up against alcoholism. Yeah, and we, we you know we have we have we have felt the pain and and we have been put in those positions and to all of a sudden be high and mighty and and take offense at someone that's expressing you know acute alcoholism is is just that's not helpful i don't think you you, you know what i'm talking about yeah i i certainly do and boy do we get our feathers ruffled if people outside of alcoholics anonymous do that to us right yeah, uh, yeah. But we we can swap that role. Um, you know, it's interesting here in what you just read that it refers to uh, mental as well as alcoholic difficulties. So uh, dealing with 
co-occurring mental health issues, that isn't something new, right? We kind of treat it like it's something new nowadays. But we were dealing with that back then. Yeah, in 19, 1946, what is that, 70 years ago? Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and it's still it's still an issue. It's still an issue today. And so so I, I believe through all of the all of these lessons, Bill somehow intuitively knew to throw the barn doors wide open. Mm. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Like like let them all come into the barn. Yeah. <laughs> you know, let everything <laughs> throw those doors wide open. And God will keep us safe and protected, like, like he like he talks about in step ten in the in the book Alcoholics Anonymous. I I, I just I'm just I just kind of believe that that's the attitude he had, you know. Well, you know what I th- I think I think Chris and it, for me it's just another evidence that God was working through Bill in such a mighty and strong way, um, putting this whole thing together. Uh, because because I don't I don't think one man could do it with his own intellect. Now I think Bill was extremely smart. I, I think he was clever. I think he was a lot of things people thought he was. <laughs> He's just like us, right? But I think the divine had to meet up with this character, and it brought us this incredible program and fellowship that we have today. Uh, that's just proof to me one more time that God's hand was in it. I I truly I truly believe that that some some things were happening then you know like so early early on when we get sober a lot of times what we experience is we experience divine coincidences coincidences that we have to attribute to the divine things 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 happen and things fall into place and we meet people and we experience things that if you would do a statistical analysis on it, it would have been 10 million to one for that one thing to have happened. Right. You know? Right. And, and and one after another happens to us in early recovery. It's just the time of divine coincidences. Yes. And, you know, I liken it to, uh, I liken it to a, a, a hug from the divine, you know, mm. and, and I think Bill had a lot of that going on. Mm-hmm. I think he was connected. I think the Oxford group step process that he undertook brought about such a change in consciousness to, that, that, that he was now awake and, and he was a channel. He was a channel for, for the architecture of this wonderful yeah. thing called Alcoholics Anonymous and all the literature involved with it. Yeah. Yeah. Well put. So it says at one time or another, most AA groups go on rule making benders. Naturally enough, too, as a group commences to grow rapidly, it is confronted with many alarming problems. Panhandlers panhandlers begin to panhandle. Members get drunk and sometimes get others drunk with them. Uh, those with mental difficulties throw depressions or break out into paranoid uh, denunciations of fellow members. Gossip, gossip, gossips, gossip, and and uh, and righteously denounce the local wolves and red riding guys. <laughs> <laughs> Newcomers argue that there aren't uh, uh, they aren't alcoholics at all, but keep coming around anyway. Slippers trade on the fair name of AA in order to get themselves jobs. Others refuse to accept all the 12 steps of the recovery program. Still, some go still further saying that the guide business is bunk and quite unnecessary. Under these conditions, our conservative program abiding members get scared. These appalling conditions must be controlled, they think, else AA will surely go to rack and ruin. They view with alarm they they view with alarm for the good of the movement, and and this is these were experiences you know I've had. Um, there's been plenty of times I got very very scared that certain things were going to impact uh, the meetings that I had grown dependent on and really fell in love with, mm-hmm. and. I got very defensive and very judgmental and, and, and critical 
Mm. I, I think what he's I think what he's trying to trying to say here is there's going to be all there's going to be an enormous diversity of experience and people that we're going to get in in Alcoholics Anonymous, and he's kind of telling us not to be scared. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. It, you know, I have to go back, and I, I think I've said this before uh, when we've talked. Um, there's a specific group that I'm thinking of that stands out to me every time I hear the word group. And a lot of the reason for it is because I attended that particular group for a very long period of time. And that that group has been around, I think I shared with you before, before the traditions were even established. And, you know, by all intents and purposes, the things that have gone on there there's every reason why that group shouldn't even exist. And yet, <laughs> yet it still does. And it still, it, it still thrives. And it's, and, and there's people that come out of that, that are, are serving God and cleaning house and helping other people clean house. And they're in positions, uh, uh, honorable positions in their jobs and, their family life is is flourishing and and you scratch your head and you go how could that possibly be uh and and yet it is so so much for our judgment calls you know bill was bill was pretty cool and very liberal with this right so so people would write letters to new york all the time saying you wouldn't believe what these two or three members in our group are doing. You know, right. you know this is this is here. Blah 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 blah. Bill always had a, a question that he would ask that he already kind of knew the answer to. Are people staying sober? Are people staying sober in that group? Mm-hmm. So he, he wouldn't say, "Have people recovered in that group?" Or do people believe in God in that group? Or or are people sponsoring in that group? He would say, are people sober in that group? Mm. You know, Mm. because I remember reading a lot of letters uh, that he had written to people uh, about group issues. Yeah. Some of them, some of them we may go over as we move through this workshop. But that, you know, is it, is it, is it working or, you know, is it, it, is it working? If it's not working, okay. But if it's, if it's working, you know, maybe Maybe the problem isn't as big as you think it is. Sure. So let me ask you this. So with 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 the uh, the conviction that has been shared with us uh, that Alcoholics Anonymous is one of the examples of it is that it's a spiritual kindergarten that would suggest there is more work to be done even beyond the meetings. True. Oh, sure. OK, so if that's the case. Um, I think sometimes we get so high and mighty that, you know, we we say, well, this is more this, there's more to this than just sobriety, you know, which is true. But are we expecting too much or more than what AA was even intended for um, by expecting them to deliver people from every situation in their lives? I, I mean, Sometimes I wonder if that's why we're so judgmental because the sobriety part sometimes isn't focused on you. You should be doing other things too. What do you think about that? You know, I've I've been a recovery guy for a long time. You know that. And I'll define, I'll define sobriety as not putting alcohol in your body. Right. (laughs) Okay. That's what sobriety is. Some people, some people liken sobriety to what you and I, would describe as you know maybe maybe some of the healing aspects of recovery uh-huh but I, I believe you know i believe recovery recovery can be defined as you know the removal of the symptoms of of, of alcoholism and yes and the main symptoms of alcoholism are self-consciousness self-seeking resentment fear you know guilt shame remorse you know all the all the mm. all the manifestations of self yeah uh, if that's what recovery is you know the 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 healing of of the emotional and mental and spiritual uh parts of us that are are ill um 
you know, I think that's I think that's what's available in Alcoholics Anonymous. But but I think Bill is is looking at this as as a mere membership in the meeting question. Right. And and uh, you know as well as I do, many people came into AA and they stayed sober for a long time until they were uh, in, until they were exposed to or or ready to approach a recovery program. Yes. So, so I think he's wise uh, mm. by uh, by concentrating only on uh, on on sobriety, uh, because you know he's he's keeping his eye right on the right ball. I think. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for thanks for sharing that. That that that's good. At this point, the group enters the rule and regulation phase. <clears throat> Excuse me. Charters, bylaws. And membership rules are excitedly passed, and authority is granted committees to filter out undesirables and discipline the evildoers. <laughs> <laughs> I've never been in that group. Uh, then the group elders, now clothed with authority, commence to get busy. Re- recalcitrants are cast into the outer darkness. Respectable busybodies thrown stone, throw stones at the sinners. As for the so-called sinners, that they either insist on staying around or else they form a new group of their own. Or maybe they join a more congenial and less intolerant crowd in their neighborhood. The elders soon discover that the rules and regulations aren't working very well. Most attempts at enforcement generate such waves of uh, uh, um, a dissension and intolerance in the group that this condition is presently recognized to be worse for the group's life than the very worst that uh, the worst ever did. <laughs> so, so you know, the the more rules you make, the the worse you're going to make your group. And remember, he was paying attention to a lot of groups. He was getting all kinds of correspondence in New York. He was going out to visit all kinds of different groups that were just getting started. He was speaking at all kinds of groups that were just getting started. So, you know, I think he's got enough experience to really understand what he's what he's telling us here in this paragraph. Yes, me too. That, you know, there are no there are no rules, you know, uh, uh, there are no there are no leaders there but trusted servants. Uh, uh, there there's no membership requirements, you know. Yeah, uh, and and things like that. It's it's pretty cool. After a time, fear and intolerance subside. The group survives unscathed. Everybody has learned a great deal. So it is that few of us are any longer afraid of what any newcomer can do to our AA reputation or effectiveness. Those who slip, those who panhandle, those who scandalize, those with mental twists, those who rebel at the program, those who trade on the AA reputation, all such persons seldom harm an AA group for long. Some of these have become our most respected and best uh, loved. Some have remained to try our patience, sober nevertheless. Others have drifted away. We've begun to regard the ones... Uh, not as menaces, but rather as our teachers. They oblige us to cultivate patience, tolerance, and humility. We finally see that they are only people sicker than the rest of us, that we who condemn them are the Pharisees uh, whose false righteousness does our group the deeper spiritual damage. You know, wow. And, yeah. You know, I was talking about I was talking about this today with somebody. So so we we are we're all on a, a spiritual path. Let's let's say we're on the way up the mountain, uh-huh. right? Yeah. And some of us, some of us are are at base camp. Some of us are at camp one. Some of us are at camp two. <clears throat> and the crazy thing is, is that we we start to think that us camp tours are better than the camp oneers. Mm-hmm. You know, we're we're all on a we're all on a, a spiritual path. We're all human beings. We're on a spiritual path. The timing is just different. Mm-hmm. You know. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, and, and and you know, this this statement um, that he makes at the end of this paragraph, it it it, it is so true. I mean, the self righteous, the leaders of the band, so to speak, the ones that. You know, the, uh, what do they call them, bleeding deacons. Sometimes they can make so much noise that the person that's actually new that's coming in and being disruptive, it, it, it becomes a minor issue over the problems that the bleeding deacons are causing. Um, we shoot ourselves in the foot when we do that. 
Yeah, you know, I, I've got some I've got some personal experience with, uh, you know, some people were showing up in the group, and I saw them as predators, right? Yeah. Uh, there, there was this there was this one guy who, uh, you know, he was he was he he he, he was a predator, and, and we've all we've all experienced this. Mm-hmm. They're they're sexual predators, mm-hmm. right? And and you know, I got in between uh, him and you know what he was you know, his, his business. Yeah. And, and it was, it didn't stop him. (laughs) (laughs) It, it caused great emotional distress in me to, to be having to be in that position. It even upset the women, (laughs) you know? Oh, wow. And, And so, 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 you know, like, like this is, you know, it's none of your business kind of a thing. And, and so my my experience trying to police certain members' behavior, unless they're my sponsees. If they're my sponsees, I've been given spiritual consent, and and I will police your behavior. Yeah, that's different. But other members, other members, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna police their behavior. Now, now you know if if somebody comes in with a, a knife and tries to stab people in a meeting or whatever, I'll call the police or whatever. I'm not crazy. Yeah. But what I'm not, what I'm not going to do is I'm, I'm not going to, I'm not going to be the morality police. Right. You know what I mean? Right. Yeah. Because I've tried it and Doesn't it work. creates <laughs> serious, <clears throat> it creates serious disturbance in the force. Yeah. <laughs> Every older AA shudders when he remembers the names of persons he once condemned, people he confidently predicted would never sober up, persons he was sure ought to be thrown out of AA for the good of the movement. Now that some of those very persons have been sober for years and may be numbered among his best friends, the old timer thinks to himself, what if everybody had judged these people as I once did? What if AA had slammed its door in their faces? Where would they be now? And, you know, this is this is true. There were some people I just absolutely couldn't stand when I first got sober. Monty did it, did, ended up, you know, going to my weddings and, you know, <laughs> you know visiting me in the hospital. Yeah. I visited them in the hospital and, and we, we got very close. Sure. So there's, you know, there's an evolution in, in our perspective. And he's making us safe from ourselves uh, with this particular tradition. Mm. That is why we all judge the newcomer less and less. If alcohol is an uncontrollable problem to him and he wishes to do something about it, that is enough for us. We care not whether his case is severe or light, whether his morals are good or bad, whether he has other complications or not. Our AA door stands wide open. And if he passes through it and commences to do anything at all about his problem, he is considered a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Wow. Hmm. Uh, commences to do anything at all about his problem. He's considered a member. He signs nothing, agrees to nothing, promises nothing. We demand nothing. He joins us on his own say-so. Nowadays, in most groups, he doesn't even have to admit he's an alcoholic. He can join A on the mere suspicion that he may be one, that he may already show the fatal symptoms of our malady. That is an interesting paragraph, isn't it, Mike? Yeah, Yeah, it is. But the truth is, that there's a lot of... I mean, my first meeting I ever went to, this, this old codger was sitting there and he put his hand on my hand and through the smoke-filled room, because it, believe me, it was smoky. <laughs> he said, hey, are you an alcoholic? And I, my answer to him was, sir, I, I don't know what I am. And he said, welcome, you're in the right place. That was his answer to me when I told him I didn't know what I was, because I really didn't know. I knew nothing about alcoholism, drug addiction. I just knew I was in trouble. That's the right, that's, he did the right thing. You know, I have seen, you know, uh, horses behinds throw, try to throw people out of meeting because they, they identify, they, they don't identify themselves correctly. And a lot of times they don't know how to identify right. themselves correctly. And yeah. a lot of times they don't know what alcoholism is. So how can they sure. admit to being an alcoholic? They, no one's, no one's taken them through the first step yet. So they don't know what alcoholism is. Right. So do you have, you know, do, do, do you have a desire to stop drinking? Uh, yeah, I have a desire for my life to get better. I think that that's all, that's all you need to have the doors open. I mm. truly believe that. Mm, yeah. 
Of course, this is not the universal state of affairs throughout AA membership rules still exist. If a member persists in coming to meetings drunk, he may be led outside. We may ask someone to take him away. But in most groups, he can come back next day if sober. Though he may be thrown out of a club, nobody thinks of throwing him out of AA. He is a member as long as he says he is. While this broad concept of AA membership is not yet unanimous, it does represent the main current of AA thought today. We do not wish to deny anyone his chance to recover from alcoholism. We wish to be just as inclusive as we can, never exclusive. You know, you know that that this is the first time. Uh, you know, the first time I remember reading this paragraph, and it really is uh, a great a great way to to describe the openness that uh, that the fellowship has. You you can show up drunk, and we're you know you're disturbing the meeting, and and tradition one really is the group welfare comes first, so you're disturbing the group's welfare, so you're going to be asked to leave. But you know, please come back tomorrow when you're sober. I, I, I've personally seen that kind of stuff happen quite a bit and it doesn't mean that you are no longer a member of aa it just means that you may need to remove yourself from that particular meeting for, yeah, the, for that time yeah. yeah yeah you're just dis- you're disturbing the meeting so so uh so but nobody throws anybody out of alcohol out of AA, yeah. you know that's pretty 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 darn cool now, some people, Monty, accuse us of being a cult. I've never seen yeah. a cult where you can be a member if you say you are, and 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 you don't have to give any money, and there are no rules. <laughs> you know, have you ever seen a cult like that? No, <laughs> I haven't. I haven't either. And I chat people that say that, uh, and I've got some very very close friends that are not. They're not in recovery. Uh, they're not members of AA um, that have said that before, and they have since corrected themselves because they know a little better now. But I always ask people like that. I said, listen, you need to look up the definition of cult. It'll blow your mind. You may find that by definition, you're in a cult. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Have you ever been in a cult without a leader? <laughs> yeah, right, right. So, so perhaps this trend signifies something much deeper than a mere change of attitude on the question of membership. Perhaps it means that we are losing all fear of those violent emotional storms which sometimes cross our alcoholic world. Perhaps it bespeaks our confidence that every storm will be followed by a calm, a calm which is more understanding, more compassionate, more tolerant than any we've ever known before. That's amazing. Mm-hmm. That's an amazing paragraph too. You know, I'm a huge fan of Bill's writing. You know, sometimes he got a little bit, you know, wordy and, you know, used descriptive, uh, 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 descriptive verbiage that, you know, maybe I would choose myself right. or I'm, I'm, I'm not used to reading that, that, you know, that style. Sure. But some of it is Deeply beautiful, don't you think, buddy? Oh, I, I, I am so enjoying this. Um, you know, when I really started getting into uh, some of the material that Bill wrote is when I became friends with Dick B. Uh, because he did, you know, when he was alive, well, I think he had something like 34 to 40 uh, books written on the history of Alcoholics Anonymous and uh, still considered today by many to be the number one authority on the history of AA. But I was reading so much material that was written by uh, the founders and, and the people involved. It just, Bill was a wordsmith. And, you know, when you read the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, one of the things that I learned very early was that we, we learn by repetition. But we're not going to listen to somebody who's saying the exact same thing in every sentence. But Bill does that, but by putting it in different wording. He is constantly repeating himself in the big book, but using different language to do it. So it keeps your attention and it gets in your head and then it moves to your heart. Uh, And and that is why I'm so grateful for the gift uh, that 
the creator had bestowed upon Bill. Uh, it's just amazing stuff to me. I, I, I just keep calling it the rich history because it is so rich. You know, thank, thank God. Thank God that Bill Wilson decided to be a writer. Imagine what would have been lost if he didn't decide to, mm. to, to, to write. Because mm -hmm. Dr. Bob never wrote. You know, right. Dr. Bob never decided to write. Right. Could you imagine if Bill never decided to write? Yeah, yeah. You know, it, 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 things, things would have been a lot different for us. Thank, thank God that, that he, that he did. But, but like, you know, some of the paragraphs that we read tonight, they're, they're stuff that I'm, is my current experience, things I'm going through, things, yeah. challenges that I personally have now, today, in some of the, you know, my experience in some of the meetings. And he talks about it with such experience and such compassion. You know, this, like, we have found that this is the attitude mm -hmm. for us to have. Mm -hmm. This is the best attitude to approach it. These are the lessons we've learned. We've become much more compassionate, you know, you know uh, much more, much more forgiving, much more understanding. And it's just, it's real food for the soul. It really is. And I'm so enjoying this particular workshop with you, Mon. Yeah, and it's it, it it he makes it very palatable, you know. He really does it, it, the way he approaches it all. Um, I've got a, so I, I've got someone I want to share, and I want to get your take on this. Being that the topic and the name of this article is, you know, who sure. who, who is a member of Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, so I I I believe that there is a difference between, um. Members claiming membership in AA and meeting attendance in AA because I think sometimes, like in the example here, sometimes a person can be asked to, to dismiss themselves from the meeting, but that doesn't disqualify them from being a member. And sometimes people in a meeting, when that happens, will will come up. You know, they'll say it out loud. Now, wait a minute. You can't kick him out of AA. Well, that's not what we're doing. We're not we're not saying he can't be an AA member. And they mistaken having to remove somebody that's being a disturbance in a meeting as being kicked out of AA. And so keeping that in mind, I'm going to tell you this little experience that I had many years ago sure. with a gentleman who um, I was sponsoring who I had no idea had the mental health issues that he had, they didn't materialize until about the third month working with him. And uh, he claimed his membership in Alcoholics Anonymous. He was very proud to be uh, a fellow member of the fellowship. And something happened where he snapped and his behaviors became so profoundly bizarre that a stocking order had to be put in place between me, my family, and this gentleman. I, I had to go to court, not a restraining order, but a stocking order. There's a big difference. Right. A, a stocking order means if I see the guy and I can clearly make out who he is from a mile down the road, I can have him arrested. That's how serious that is. And stocking orders, in the state of Oregon anyway, are for life. So that is a very serious thing. So you can imagine the seriousness of the behavior that was coming from this man. So I'm going to my home group one day, right? And somebody finds out about this and brings it up during the smoke break and says, well, you can't refuse him attendance at the AA meeting. And I'd never had this happen to me before. And so my statement to that person was, I, I myself am not refusing him attendance here. But the law says he cannot be in the same room as me. That's a declaration of the courts. Now, my question to you is, doesn't the law of the land trump any policy that AA has? Well, I, you know, I would go back to you're not you're not banning him from attending AA. No, 
you, you, you know, he's he the the he's just he just doesn't get custody of the meeting that you're in because there's a stalking order. Yes. You know, your your personal safety is should be of utmost concern to anybody in that AA group and, mm-hmm. and I don't think it should have been controversial. Yeah, I didn't either. He, he needs he needs to take it down the road. Yeah, and that was another thing. There's an A meeting on every corner in this town. And, yeah. and, and I'm like, you know, but there I, I became the bad guy because don't you know I'm 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 wherever I go to a meeting now he's not allowed to be there, therefore I'm keeping his recovery from him. And it was just like I said, it was a long time ago. It was it was early on for me as well. Um I'd only been sponsoring people probably for three years at that point. Um so yeah, it it was it was a cause for controversy and it was cause for much concern, and um, you know I received some figurative hate mail from it. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, listen, the 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 law is a law, and and judgments, and uh, ju- you know, and requirements from courts and all that stuff. That's that's part of living in the world, and it's part of our responsibility as, as, as mm-hmm. citizens. And, you know, re- recover, recovery is part about, uh, partly about being a responsible citizen. So, you know, I don't, I don't, you're not barring him from membership in AA. Like no. you said, he just can't go to the same meeting you go to, right. you know? Right. Uh, and, and if somebody doesn't, understand that uh, you can get kicked out of an AA club you know for being a jerk sure uh, and not be allowed at any of the meetings in that AA club because the club is separate separately incorporated right right that, that still is not kicking you out of AA you can be an AA member you're just gonna have to do it somewhere else yes yep yep yeah so uh, I, I I think I I think I agree with you uh, uh, about you know the the perspective your 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 perspective is the same as mine yeah yeah i i that's what i figured that's what i figured and and, and in fact there were people that were well seasoned in that group that came alongside of me and supported me but there it was a large group so there was a there was a lot of people that i i just don't think they they knew better you know they were they were trying to do the right thing they were just misinformed yeah 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 all right well, listen, uh, next week is the topic will be, will AA ever have a personal government? Anybody oh want anybody want to place bets on that one? <laughs> so it, it's, it's the weird title ones, Monty, that are really extraordinary. I know. You know? <laughs> like AA and money, you know? Yeah. Like, 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 uh, it's probably going to be really a lot of fun. Yeah. That's great. All right, my friend, any closing thoughts? No, no. Okay, good deal. Um, Listen, everybody, uh, you can go back and listen to all the previous episodes of Walking Through the Language of the Heart. Visit our website at take12radio.com and click on the Recovery Workshops banner, and there you'll find it. Um, You can download those for fun and for free. Make copies of them. Share them if you like. All we ask is you're on your honor and you don't, use those CDs for any kind of financial gain. Uh, we we want to make sure that this stuff is free to all who wish to partake of it. All right, Chris, thank you so much, my friend. We'll talk to you next week, okay? All right, take care, Monty. All right, until our next broadcast, <laughs> this is the Monty Man along with Chris S., and we are wishing God's perfect serenity for you. For more recovery workshops with Chris S. and the Monty Man, visit our website at take12radio.com and click on the Recovery Workshops banner.
This has been a broadcast of Take 12 Recovery Radio and KHLT Recovery Broadcasting. Kitty, 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 meow, meow, meow. Woof, woof.